It is 9 a.m. and I call the San Mateo County Planning Commission meeting of November 29, 2023 to order. We are meeting in the San Mateo County board chambers as well as via Zoom. Please rise and join me for Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Madam Clerk, please proceed with the roll call. Commissioner Hansen? Here. Commissioner Ketcham? Here. Commissioner Serrano Kwan? Commissioner Ramirez? Here. Chair Gupta? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. We'll now open public comments for items that are not on the agenda. Madam Clerk, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will first call upon members in chambers, followed by speakers on Zoom. For in-person comments, the speakers slips are located in the ante room. On Zoom, please use the raised hand feature or star nine if you're calling by phone. And we have nobody wishing to speak in chambers, but we do have one virtual hand raised on Zoom. So I will call on Fran Fuller. Okay. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. One second, please. Go ahead, Ms. Pollard. <clears throat> Okay, good morning. I just want to bring you up to date. I want to thank you all for voting last month for, um, or the last meeting, I guess it was, um, to have uh, the signs up for no, le no dogs in, I mean, dogs must be on leashes in the community park in Quarry Park. Um, it, it, thank you for passing that and, um, Within a few days, the county has put the signs up. And so now it says the dogs have to be on leashes in that community park. And even though I see people still playing in there, um, I, eventually I guess it'll, the, it'll stop. And I've seen rangers now telling them that they can't play with the dogs in that part of the park, but they can play everywhere else, I think, in, the, in Quarry Park. So thank you again. And um, happy holidays to everybody. Thank you, That's Ms. Pollard. Thank you. And with that, Madam Chair, we have no further hands raised for items not on the agenda. Okay, since there are no further public comments, uh, we'll close the public comments and move on uh, to our next item, which is the consent agenda. Uh, we have consideration of the minutes for the Planning Commission hearings from November 8, 2023. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Uh, roll call, uh, Madam Clerk. That was a motion by Commissioner Ketchum and a second by Commissioner Ramirez. Commissioner Hansen? Abstain. Commissioner Ketchum? Aye. Commissioner Ramirez? Aye. Chair Gupta? Aye. Thank you, Chair. Motion carried. Uh, next, we move on to the regular agenda. Um, Madam Clerk, could you please read that in and uh, introduce the uh, presenter? Owner applicant, Paul Goswami, file number PLN. 2022-00321, location 890 Upland Road, Emerald Lake Hills, assessor's parcel number 058-272-120, project planner Camille Leung. Good morning, planning commissioners, morning staff. All right, the project is located at 890 Upland Road, shown here. Um, 
the top left, the bottom, sorry, bottom left is the view from the road. Um, the parcel is approximately one acre. Um, and the proposal is to divide the lot into three lots. There's an existing house at the rear of the lot, along with an existing driveway to access the existing house. Uh, they will create lots one and two that will um, have access by the existing driveway and lot three on the right will be accessed directly from Upland Road. The zoning is residential hillside design review with a minimum lot size of 12,000. Um, they do comply with zoning. However, the three lot subdivision does not uh, comply with the current land use density designation of low density residential. So they propose a change in the general plan land use to medium low density residential. So this map shows you the area of the current low density designation in yellow. Um, and you can see the higher medium low density, the proposed designation in green on the top left. So while the parcel is uh, surrounded uh, to the uh, north, west and east by low density residential. Um, there are some smaller parcels within the city of Redwood City located to the south and the medium low density residential uh, designation that it seeks is about 300 feet away to the north. The proposal includes removal of one heritage tree and six significant trees. All the trees are shown here. The um, the trees are actually all on the parcel. I think the trees layer shifted a little bit. Um, so they're all on the parcel. Um, three is the heritage tree. It's a large 54 inch heritage valley oak. Um, and I'll describe more of its condition uh, later in this, uh, soon in this presentation. And then the others are significant trees. Um, with special note of tree 26, which is a 38 inch significant valley oak that's also proposed removal along with the other trees shown on this slide. And these trees are not, uh, oops. these trees are directly related to the subdivision um, and the proposed uh, building footprints for the homes, but there are there will be additional homes potential, sorry, there will be additional trees removed when the tree permits, um, design review permits come in for the new homes. So these are these are mostly subdivision related tree removals. So as shown in the photos here, these are from the Arborist reports. Um, there's tree number three on the left and tree number 26 on the right. The arborists, uh, along with our county arborists, agreed that um, the project arborist um, had shown substantial evidence of decay and um, within the upper canopy and in the lower canopy with the heritage tree number three on the left and also decay in the upper canopies of, the, of tree number 26 on the right. Uh, causing or posing a, a, a health hazard, a structural hazard uh, for the tree to uh, properties as well as to structures as well as to inhabitants. This is the landscaping plan for replacement of the proposed tree removals. They include a, a replacement with the tree number three with a replacement of two 48 inch box valley oak trees and the replacement of tree number 26 with one 36 inch valley oak. The applicant, uh, the, I would say the project includes the demolition of a house, um, the existing house, which was built in 1920. The applicant has provided a historical report discussing whether the house meets the criteria of San Mateo County for as a historic resource, and it does not meet those criteria. 
the report and the project was reviewed by the San Mateo County Historical Resources Advisory Board, uh, which also did not find that the um, house was a historical, significant historical resource. However, the Historical Resources Advisory Board um, did request that the house be photographed with a high resolution camera. Um, both the exterior, the interior, and the outbuildings on the property, uh, that certain special elements, such as the glass windows, rubber beams, built-ins, and similar features be salvaged or saved. And these have all been included in mitigation measure 20 of the negative declaration. In terms of general plan conformance, the project complies with policies regarding infilling, of urban areas. Also, the project complies with wastewater policies regarding um, sewage being the preferred uh, method of wastewater management in urban areas. So the existing house is on a septic system, and that septic system would be destroyed, and all three of the new homes would be connected to the city of Redwood City, subject to approval by LAFCO and the city of Redwood City. And then it also the project also complies with housing element policy 11, which encourages modification of general plan land use designations and zoning regulations to accommodate the construction of needed new housing units. In terms of the subdivision proposed, uh, it complies with the subdivision regulations, um, including having completed the de development footprint analysis, as well as the major development pre-application workshop. Uh, the proposed lot two, which is a flag lot, meets the applicable requirements pertaining to flag lots, um, essentially not including the long access driveway um, into the lot size uh, for determination or calculation of lot um, area or lot coverage. And that the uh, corridor, it will be in fee ownership with the lot that it accesses, um, that the access corridor has a minimum width um, along its entirety of 20 feet or, or wider. And also that the design of the subdivision and associated improvements will not conflict with any easements. There are no easements currently on the property. There will be an easement over um, the lot to access easement to provide access to lot one and two. In terms of the grading permit requested, the project complies with the findings of the grading permit. Uh, the applicant uh, would comply with the conditions of approval requiring excavated earth to be removed from the site, application of erosion control measures, limited um, grading during the wet season, and also requiring the project engineer to submit written certification that all grading has been completed uh, with the approved plans. The project complies with the CEQA, the environmental, uh, the California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, the main potential in, environmental impacts identified by the negative declaration were the tree removals, um, the demolition of the, house, of the house that was built in 1920. Um, there were no comments on the neg deck directly, um, but we did receive project comments um, and at the pre-application stage and also most recently, um, the concerns expressed in the major development pre-application workshop were around parking and drainage, um, concerns around large vehicles uh, related to the construction parking along the road. Um, so mitigation measure 17 prohibits that um, all construction parking needs to be located on site. And then also uh, members of the public raised concerns about drainage, which would be, um, which would be resolved by the project needing to comply with the county's drainage manual that uh, project related runoff not cross property lines and be retained and treated on site. So with that, um, staff recommends that the planning commission recommend that the board of supervisors, so that because of the general plan amendment, the final decision on this project is uh, the board of supervisors.
Um, so staff recommends that the planning commission recommend that the board of supervisors adopt a resolution adopting the initial study negative declaration for the general plan amendment, matter subdivision and grading permit. Um, and also to adopt a resolution amending the general plan land use map to change the land use designation from low to medium low density residential. And then also to approve the minor subdivision and grading permit uh, by making the required findings and adopting the conditions of approval and attachment A. So that concludes staff's presentation and staff is available for any questions. Thank you. Let's see. So, um, commissioners have questions for the staff? No, that's very good. Commissioner Hansen, Commissioner Ketchum. I just wanted to say I appreciate the detail uh, of the tree evaluation. I know the arbor's not here, but uh, it was very helpful. And also the photos in your presentation to understand, you know, if you just hear heritage tree and you, you can imagine the possibilities there are stupendous, but it, it really helps to see the actual trees. Thank you. Commissioner Serrano. Um, I have a um, question. Um, I don't know whether uh, uh, this is the question uh, for the staff or for uh, the applicant, but in terms of, uh, I was reading about the final map um, once the subdivision, if subdivision is approved, uh, so, is it recorded when it says the final map is recorded? What does it consist of? Uh, so, say the board of supervisors takes action after the recommendation by the planning commission. Um, at that time, uh, the applicant would need to show compliance with having met all the conditions of approval as, support, as approved by the Board of Supervisors. So that generally takes about six months to a year. Um, and they have to work with the County Department of Public Works um, mapping section um, to make sure that the final map meets the state requirements for, subdiv for subdivisions generally. Um, and so what they'll do, the uh, County Surveyor, kind of coordinates all of this um, between the condition checking from the Department of Public Works planning and any other agencies, um, as well as sort of the, the actual map, the format of the mapping. So he'll coordinate all that. And at the time the conditions are met and the map meets the requirements of the state and the county, then that map gets recorded. And, and then the parcels, the parcel becomes split at split. that point. And then okay. Deeds are created for the new parcel configurations so that the parcels could be sold. Okay. So, so then um, when we see a map of the whole area, then it it would look like it, it would have separate light, right. lines drawn. Yeah, it'll, it'll right. take a little while. Uh, yeah. yeah, whatever time it takes, uh, a year or longer. Uh, then it would it would show as a separate parcel with a separate uh, uh, EPN, number. Yes, uh, and later addressed when it goes through the building permit process. Yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, it meets the minimum lot size, right, yes. for the for that neighborhood. Yes. Uh, each lot. Okay. Um, and uh, and per California uh, laws or regulations, uh, there could be a ADU. Uh, it would be allowed. Yes. Uh, in addition to a residence, yes. they they could uh, build a ADU on it also. Mm -hmm. So the, these removal of the trees will take place before? Uh, There's a condition requiring, uh, for specifically for the significant trees, trees number three and 26, that um, they not be removed at the time of subdivision, but at the time that the homes are proposed on the lots. Okay. So at this time, we are not um, approving 
You are approving the removal, but they can't actually physically be removed until later. All that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have no more questions. Uh, so at this time, would the applicant, uh, is the applicant here and would they like to uh, speak? Okay. So you have 15 minutes. Good morning, uh, commissioners. My name is Jay Rodine. I also send a good morning greeting to Mr. Monowitz and Mr. Fox. Uh, having been a former member of your esteemed commission, I trust that you've all reviewed the staff reports. Uh, we can make our comments very briefly, but I would like to introduce our team. My client and the applicant, Mr. Paul Goswami, would you stand up, please? And then we have with us to answer any questions that the commission might have our civil engineer, Dan McLeod, our landscape architect, Mara Young, and our project architect, Ray Kalahara. So with that, I really appreciate all the work that the staff has done in getting us to this point. And <clears throat> we would trust that the commission, in short, would follow the recommendation of their staff. This project has been in the works for about a year and a half now. I came on board at a point in time when uh, the public pre-application meeting raised a number of issues that have, I think, all been addressed. Uh, you've probably received some letters of support. I know there may be one or two speakers here also supporting the application. But we'd like to defer for a moment and ask if we couldn't put up um, the architectural rendering done by Greg, um, which shows a conceptual plan of what two of the the, the front of two of the houses are, and then also the uh, landscape plan as well. Did, that's about Mars landscaping plan. There we go. There was some concern, and we addressed that through the Arborist reports, not one, but three. Uh, the second Arborist report was done in December of 2022, and that was followed up working with the county's arborist to do a specific type of scientific test, a drill tap test on a couple of the trees that were significantly large. One was a heritage, but it was in very bad condition. But prior to seeking the county arborist consent and recommendation for removal based on safety issues, we went through those steps to address those questions. To offset that, some of the conditions of mitigation and the mitigated neg deck, as well as the project approval, requires that we provide specifically a certain number of replacement trees, but more specifically trees three and 26, which are going to be removed, 48 inch box oak. So uh, for what's coming down, we'll replace those and place them in a better position where they won't compete with one another. With respect to answering uh, Chippers and Gupta's question on the final map, um, this is a tentative application. As you know, your recommendation to go to the Board of Supervisors, which makes a legislative decision to amend the land use plan of Emerald Lake Hills. That plan, as indicated in your staff report, was done in from 1978 to 1980 is a broad brush measure prior to creating sewer services up in Emerald Hills. And the purpose behind the low density residential designation was to stop more development until such time as both the Redwood City and San Mateo County were able to provide sewer services fully recognizing and it's contained in your staff report and in my letter to Mr. Monowitz of November 28th, 2022, which are the last four pages of your staff report, uh, county recognized there would be changes and this application is not a precedent center. It's something that's following others that have occurred in the past with the recognition that now that there is a full range of public services, a higher density land use could be considered. Is this high density? No, we're asking for medium low density. The density of our project is 2.9 units per acre, which is substantially lower than the highest range on the land use, um, land use designation we're proposing. 
At this point, I'd like to conclude my presentation and say that our team is fully available to address any questions that you might have. And if you'd like a presentation from any of them, we're more than happy. Thank you very much. We hope you support the staff's recommendation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rudin. Uh, commissioners have any questions for Mr. Rudin? Thank you. Uh, so at this time, I would like to uh, open for uh, public comments, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we did receive one written public comment that was distributed to the commission and posted to the website. And we do have three speaker slips from staff. Does staff still wish to speak on this item? With uh, Greg Kau Kau Kawahaba. Questions, okay. Brian Jacobs. Morning, Commission. I'm just here to express my support for this project, um, but in general, supporting projects that bring any new residential units to uh, the available market. I think it's important for you to hear support. I know there's a lot of times you're hearing, especially from neighbors, but, but ordinary citizens that are not in support of expanding more housing, um, but in any neighborhood, in any area, including Emerald Hills and these, these areas, we need more housing and in general. I'm here to support that and, of course, to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will now call on Dan McLeod. I'm sorry, I'm with the uh, Thank you. Well, staff will now call on Denise Souza. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Denise Souza, and I live across the street from the proposed um, project. I'm at 873 Upland Road, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my neighbors. We did not receive notice of the meeting, so um, one of them's out of the country. Another one had a medical appointment conflict, and um, so I just wanted to let you know it's not just me who's raising two issues that we want to make sure are documented in the public record. The first issue um, regarding the proposed project project that we don't feel has been adequately addressed is that in regards to drainage in the area. We are going from a low density drainage situation to a um, medium density drainage situation. Um, one house on a property to um, potentially three to six if you add the ADUs. And we're going from land that has large heritage and um, trees and root systems supporting the soil there. It's on a steep slope. We're um, across the street, but we're also in a canyon that slopes down. Um, we're going from all those trees to hardscape um, and an additional proposed driveway that does not exist there currently. So if you were to go back to the picture of the beautiful homes that are being built, you can see that it's no longer all trees and woodlands with a good solid root system. You've got a hardscape everywhere. Um, the other thing is um, no additional um, plans are in, are in place to address the drainage. Um, they keep telling us that everything, the sewage, the drainage, the infrastructure as it currently exists is adequate to support the additional um, development in the area and the residents and the neighbors just based on past experience with, with drainage in the area um, just can't possibly believe that you can go from low to medium de density without um, addressing an old infrastructure um, with regard to water storage or um, expanding it or even have people come over and look at it. I don't think anyone even has physically come out and look to see the current condition of the interest infrastructure with regard to the drainage. Um, also our neighbor who built their, um, the neighbors across the street who built the home to the adjoining property at the time were required by the county to put in a sidewalk, curbs, gutters and retaining wall because to address drainage issues. And it, it just seems odd to me that this project wasn't required to do the same. The second issue that is of concern to the neighbors is that we're gonna be going it's it's very narrow, windy um, road. We're going to be going from um, three 
garbage cans out there to potentially nine to 18. My um, neighbor with the medical issues has concerns. She has the ambulances that come there on a frequent basis. She has concern that the vehicles will not be able to get to her home and that um, larger um, two cars will not be able to pass. And so that I told her I would raise that with you as well as a second issue that we don't feel has been adequately addressed um, for the neighborhood. That concludes my comments, if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Souza. Thank you. I We will now call on Mike Souza. Um, first, I just like to address the comment previously who said well, he appreciates the additional housing that we're putting in the area. I don't understand it, how that's going from one house to three houses is helping in our population or additional housing in this area. When we're going from, you know, a, a small, you know, a one acre lot, we're now adding three, four, approximately four million dollar homes each. How is that helping out the people who can't afford the houses? I don't, to me, that's, I just sort of laugh when I heard that comment. Second, the oak tree that is in the middle of the lot. There is nothing around that, that tree. The tree was in beautiful conditions of, until about two years ago when the, house, the property was sold. After that, this, every, every 200 year old tree is gonna take abuse over the years. We have one of the largest ones right across the street. It has issues. We pay $4,000 every two to three years to get that again trimmed and maintained. At least the last two, three, four years, that tree has not been maintained, not has done nothing. It's just been ignored. Trees have to be maintained. They have to be taken care of, just like a plant, like a rose bush, anything else. It's sad. The, my wife made the point about retaining walls. If you look at all the new developments on that street, on the county side, because we're on the city side, on the other side of the street, everyone had to put a retaining wall. I'm not sure why, Every time we get a new, a new commission or stuff, new rules, the rules change. Some of the people had to put sidewalks, some had to put retaining walls. This one, no sidewalks, no retaining walls. I have no idea, I just don't understand it. We have the really narrow turn. We right now, a fire department goes through there or a garbage truck, it blocks the whole street. So now we're gonna go again, we're putting more, as my wife said, more garbage cans, more, you know, everything on the street, it's going to cause an issue. And we have lots of dog walkers, lots of people walking the street. It's very dangerous as it is right now. And I don't care about the development. I understand we need to add work. They're going to develop and they have every right to add three houses. But let's figure out how to, you know, make a wider driveway, make that one big driveway, make it wider, do something. Now we're adding two driveways, lots of hardscape. And Again, as we, my wife said previously, we were not notified. Everybody below us on our house, which we're on top of the hill and moves down, nobody's notified. Not one, no, nobody even knew about this meeting. This is the first, uh, last Tuesday when they had our discussion up in the yard. That was the first time we were able to be there. We never were invited to any. So we were very disappointed that the communications project has just, we being very, sad so and just because we're across the street and we have seen the water my wife every day since hour to two hours cleaning the gutters because we get rains that water fills up in our street and it's we're very concerned with the water issues so that's, that's all i have thank you thank you mr suiza we will now call on the last speaker in chambers, and that is Mara Young. Gotcha. Thank you. And Madam Chair, there are no virtual hands raised on Zoom for item two. So we have no further public comment for this item. Thank you. So in that case, uh, we'll close the public hearing. Oh. Would staff like to comment on any uh, yes, comments from public? Excuse me. Thank you, Chair Gupta. Uh, I just wanted to address the noticing issue. I did pull out the noticing 
the mailing list that was used uh, to notify residents of this hearing. It's a four page list of about a hundred um, properties and um, it does include um, Mr. and Mrs. Mr. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Salza's property is being uh, sent to notice. So I'm not sure why they didn't receive it, but notice was sent out. I'm not sure. This is the first time, you know, it's not for their signature, but for a mail. In our mailbox last week, for a meeting, that's the first time we've ever received two of them. That's his question. Okay, so, um, oh, Director Monovitz does have a uh, few on the list, and we'll make sure that it happens next, yeah. in the future. Can I ask, can, can you address a little bit about the drainage um, situation that there is a concern on? Certainly. So all new development is required to um, include drainage facilities that ensure the amount of drainage and the velocity of drainage doesn't change as compared to existing um, the drainage patterns. So generally that is looked at in detail at the time that building permits are submitted. At this point, we are just looking at, you know, the um, how the lots will be divided. I don't know if uh, planner Camille Leung has anything to add. Yeah, can we um, go back to the presentation? There's um, fire retention basins shown on the property. Um, and the civil engineer is also here. So as you can see, well, a little bit faint, but the above, that's our next extension pipes, um, in all the back, so the backyards of lots two and three, uh, they're, they're kind of like a trench uh, detail right there. And then there's also one in front of lot one. So drainage from the development would uh, be directed to each of those detection pipes. Um, it's it's a, I believe it's a C3, it's a C3 Okay, so this subject is, uh, yeah. sorry, this project is subject to provision C3 of the state municipal regional permit, which means that if it goes over 10,000 square feet of new impervious surface, that uh, the development, the runoff from the development is required not only to just to be detained and metered, you know, to the roadway or what have you, but to be detained and treated on site, to be infiltrated back into the ground. Um, and with that, every uh, new parcel that's created with a new house would uh, be required to record a operation and maintenance agreement for the maintenance and uh, insured operation of those facilities into the future. So the owners would be responsible for maintaining those systems. Um, uh, the project civil engineer is probably the best person to answer. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Dan McLeod with McLeod & Associates. I'm the project uh, land surveyor and the project civil engineer. So I understand drainage is a concern. Uh, the question is how much impervious area is going to end up on this site? Um, can, right now we have a conceptual plan that uh, shows what could be done. Um, we've indicated that, as Camille had mentioned, we do have stormwater detention and stormwater treatment on each lot. Uh, we will be submitting drainage calculations and plans that are in accordance with the San Mateo County drainage manual. They will be reviewed by extensively by public works before they approve the project. Um, I have talked to, uh, at the neighborhood meeting, I did talk to Miss Souza, who lives across the street, who was up here previously, and I talked to their next door neighbor 
They advised me that they think there's drainage problems in the street. I did offer to meet with them anytime they're available, even within the next couple of weeks before the holidays to go over what their concerns are and what they've seen out there during heavy rains. And we will do whatever we can to alleviate that. Um, although what we're required to do is not to increase runoff off of this particular site, which we will do by the uh, stormwater retention system. But we will also I'll meet with the neighbors to see what the issue is in front of their properties. And if it's caused by this property, we will do what we can to alleviate that. Thank you. So what what is um, county's um, pol policies on uh, reviewing the drainage when the design comes in? Yeah, so we have a um, drainage engineer Sorry, I thought my mic was on. We we have a drainage engineer on staff who um, determines, uh, reviews the submitted drainage plan to determine whether or not it complies with all the relevant county standards. And we work with public works to make sure that any runoff that's exiting the site addresses storm drain within the right of, um, storm water flows within the right of way. Thank you. You're welcome. But again, that's uh, to be looked at at, uh, at the permit. Uh, at the building permit building stage, permit it stage. will certainly be looked at in more detail. I think as part of the subdivision, what we want to make sure is that when we create lots, that those lots have adequate capacity to provide the sort of Correct. stormwater management that will be required at the building permit stage. And we have made that determination. So is the grading and uh, drainage uh, done, like approved at the same time? We definitely look at the two in conjunction with in one another. Okay. Absolutely. Makes sense. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Ketcher. Uh, thank you. What, at what's, okay, what is the policy for requiring sidewalk uh, on the street frontage and um, at, okay. My concern is, of course, it was brought up by the public. And also if you look at Google Street View and you go down to Street View, and you look along the street and the house, I guess the new house next door to this parcel, there's a sidewalk. And then when they reach this parcel under discussion today, you can't even walk straight on the dirt because it's 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 a slope there. Uh, and you'd, you'd have to at that point walk out into the uh, roadway. So would, as, as a general, thing would the county require them to grade that whatever is required retaining wall or whatever and put a sidewalk there and at what point would that happen i think camille's ready to answer that question uh, i'm looking at this plan and i'm not sure i see a new sidewalk no. i don't think it was required by the department of public works um so i, I don't i do not believe a sidewalk is required in this area Okay. So, and to answer your question, the policy is really set by the public works re review, and I'm not sure in, in this case why public works did not require a sidewalk, but that is something that we can um, follow up with them on. Yeah, I think that's really important. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, apparently, the applicant has some additional information to offer if the commission is willing to entertain that. Please, please go ahead. Yes, thank you for indulging me for a moment again. Uh, <clears throat> Emerald Hill Lake Hills is a patchwork of different properties. Many of those parcels are in incorporated Redwood City. Others are in the county. The county's policy has generally been not to require sidewalks. More recently, I'm doing a subdivision in the Emerald Hill section of unincorporated Redwood City, and they've softened their position because 
there's no continuity between lots that have sidewalks and those those that don't. And in this latest project, we're simply providing decomposed granite because sidewalks in one spot create drainage problems for other properties that don't. And so the whole rural residential concept of being in Emerald Lake Hills was one that was envisioned without sidewalks. I hope that addresses your question. As a policy matter, we don't have to do it in the county unless the board adopts a policy accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. I think this is an issue that doesn't, might not occur if you're just looking at the site plan. You have to be on the street and see what's, imagine yourself walking down the street. Commissioner Rivers, would we like to? Um, yeah, give me one second. Um, I think I'm gonna, if you indulge me, um, I'm going to uh, propose um, the motion for this. Um, um, I move that uh, the Planning Commission recommend that the Board of Supervisors, uh, number one, adopt a resolution uh, adopting the initial study mitigated negative declaration for the general plan amendment, minor subdivision, and grading permit for the project. Two, adopt a resolution amending the San Mateo County general plan land use map to change the land use designation of a assessor's parcel number 058-272-120 from low density residential to medium low density residential. And three, approve the minor subdivision and grading permit uh, as per county, county file number PLN 2022-00321 by making the required findings and adopting the conditions of approval in attachment A. I'll second that. Madam Clerk, roll call. Thank you. That was a motion by Commissioner Ramirez and a second by Commissioner Hansen. Commissioner Hansen? Aye. Commissioner Ketchum? Aye. Commissioner Serrano Quan? Aye. Commissioner Ramirez? Aye. Chair Gupta? Aye. Thank you, Chair. Motion carries. We move on to item three. Madam Chair? Could you please that read that in and introduce the presenter? Item three, Ronald and Lauren McLeod. Appellant, Ronald McLeod and Candace Wilhelm. Applicant, S.P. McClanahan. File number PLN 2022-00045. Location 531 San Benito Avenue, North Fair Oaks. Assessor's parcel number 060-161-040, and the project planner is Angela Chavez. Good morning, commissioners and staff. Um, as mentioned, um, the project before you today is consideration of an appeal of the community development director's decision to deny a significant tree removal permit um, for a 24.3 inch diameter coast redwood tree. Um, the project is pursuant to uh, the San Mateo County Ordinance Code section 12,000, um, which deals with uh, significant tree protection and removal. Um, the property um, is located at 531 San Benito Avenue in the unincorporated North Fair Oaks area of the county and is shown here. I apologize, it's a little faint, um, but in the blue box. Um, dashed lines there. Um, this property is located approximately 0.21 of a mile from Middlefield Road. This is, as you can see here, an established residential neighborhood. Um, the parcel is currently developed with a two-story single-family residence, an attached garage, and pool. 
Um, the property is well landscaped, and aside from the proposed removal of the redwood tree, no other development is currently proposed. Um, and then just to give you a little bit of background, the coastal redwood tree is kind of here off to your right um, with the blue box calling it out. Um, so an application was received by staff for a significant tree removal permit to remove the subject coast, re coast redwood tree. Um, the application included an arborist report um, that noted that the tree was in good health but that there were safety concerns due to the tree's proximity to the house and utility services. As part of the permit processing, notice of the application was mailed to all neighbors within 100 feet of the property and site posters were placed um, on site for 10 days. During the 10 day comment period, staff received correspondence from 11 neighbors um, in opposition and one in support of the proposed removal of the tree. The correspondence in opposition to the removal cited um, the concerns over the loss of a healthy tree, the benefit of large significant trees to the environment and the neighborhood aesthetic, and just the general over loss of significant trees in the neighborhood. The correspondence in support of the removal expressed concern about drought impacts on the health of the tree, the size of the tree and the potential the tree had to damaging structures, both on the subject property and neighboring property. Um, staff reviewed the project application materials along with all submitted comments and was ultimately unable to make the required findings to approve the application. A denial of the application was issued on April 19th, 2023, and the property owner and neighboring, neighboring property owner filed appeals on May 1st and May 3rd, respectively. Um, so I'm just going to go over the two sets of um, appeal comments that we received, um, the first being from the property owner, and then the second set being from the neighboring property owner. Um, so the first comment was that the homeowner had requested a copy of the county arborist report and had not received one. Um, the applicant was advised the county, arbor county arborist does not complete an arborist report as part of their review. Um, the county arborist conducts a peer review of the submitted arborist reports, but does not complete a separate review. Um, the county arborist did review the submitted arborist report and determined that the subject tree and related circumstances did not justify making the uh, just not justify making the findings required to issue the permit. Um, the second finding was that the tree was too close to the existing development. The applicant noted that the subject tree is located five feet from a high pressure gas line that serves the house, six feet from the foundation of the residence, and one foot from the pool equipment's shed foundation. Um, and I'd just like to provide some photos. Um, so this is um, from the Arbus report, um, kind of from the yard facing towards the street. The tree is um, indicated by the red arrow. Um, and, and essentially what staff's review found was that the pro proximity of the tree to the reference structures didn't show that there was any actively present issues. So we're not seeing any raised areas or damage. Um, and while the subject coastal tree is quite large and obviously is located in the side yard, there was no evidence that is cur currently damaging any adjacent structures or improvements. Um, the previous disrupt disruption that was noted in the Arbus report to the walkway foundation and gas line were mitigated through previous root removal, a gas line repair to the shed and replacement of the walkway. Um, in our second set of comments, what staff found, and as we kind of discussed in the staff report, that while the neighbor provided more kind of detailed points, they're essentially sim similar to the nature of appeal point two that I just discussed. Um, we think it's important to sort of point to the fact that the county significant tree ordinance 
was adopted in acknowledgement of the valuable and distinctive natural resource that the existing and future trees and tree communities located within the county of San Mateo uh, provide. Acknowledging this, the ordinance provides us a list of application requirements, including an arborist report, and provides required findings necessary for an approval of an application. The tree cover in this neighborhood, as you saw, is substantial, with many trees being located uh, adjacent to walkways, the street, and homes. Following the appellant's argument, most of the neighborhood trees would be suitable for removal, which would be inconsistent with the objectives of the county's tree regulations. This ordinance seeks to evaluate each individual tree and its unique conditions to determine if the required findings can be made. In this case, that would include the subject's tree's current condition. The provided, arbor, the provided arborist report noted that the subject redwood tree is in good health. The report made no mention of, nor was there any evidence of visible broken branches. And the report confirms that issues with root intrusion were mitigated via previous actions. And just um, kind of give you a proximity picture. Um, so the tree again off to the right here, the property owner's house to the left, and then kind of in the background on the right hand side, you can see the neighboring property. Um, So you can see that there is some distance there. And then kind of moving on, in terms of the overhead proximity lines that were mentioned in the appeal comments and the proximity to the neighboring oak tree, I have some additional photos for you. Um, previously, and the photos that were provided in your um, in the arborist report that were included as an attachment of the staff report showed that there were low branches touching communication lines, um, but that the power lines appeared to be separated from the trunk of the redwood tree. Um, it was the county arborist opinion at that time that clearance from the communication lines could be achieved through pruning. Um, on a recent site visit, staff was able to confirm that the lower branches do appear to have been pruned, and you can see that there's clearance on the left-hand side there. Um, as to the proximity of the neighboring oak tree, staff is unable to substantiate the potential impacts to that tree, as the arborist report did not include an assessment of the oak tree, nor was it included as rationale for the removal of the subject redwood tree. Furthermore, while the oak and coastal oak tree and the coastal redwood tree have canopies which are growing into each other, at least visually, the oak tree appears to be in good health. So just pointing to this uh, significant tree ordinance, section 12,023 provides the criteria for approval. Um, so based on this, we have staff determined that the 12 possible findings as listed here, um, we were unable to make these findings based on the information provided. And therefore it is remains our recommendation that the planning commission uh, deny the appeal and uphold the decision of the community development director to deny the removal of the subject tree subject to the finding of denial that's listed in attachment A. Uh, that concludes my presentation and I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Chavez. Uh, questions? Commissioner Ketchup, do you have any question? Um, is the, uh, st uh, staff, no. Thank you, staff. Any questions? No. I don't have any question. Yeah. Okay. This is the applicant. Uh, would you like to uh, oh, yeah. speak? In? Share it. I, we can, sure. Oh, 
Okay. Um, hello, my name's Ron McLeod. Uh, I, I don't have staff introduced, but my wife, Lauren McLeod, is back up. Um, so um, this is a copy of the arborist report that uh, kind of generated my request to remove the tree. A couple of things I wanted to note on there uh, is, first of all, um, the arborist is a ISA certified arborist and is also a qualified tree risk assessor. So has uh, significant qualifications to assess the potential risk uh, of that tree being there. And the risk that he uh, noted where there is a conflict with the power line, uh, and I'll show you another picture that shows it, uh, although it isn't when it's, when it's not moving, it doesn't touch the tree, but it's inches away from the tree. And I've observed during the storms last winter when it, that it does contact the tree, the main power line does contact the tree and can fray the power lines. Um, there is conflict with the gas line and that was noted on the by permit and by the planner. Um, uh, and there's currently some damage starting to occur on the foundation of the shed that's nearby. Um, so the next, oh, it's, so um, you know if you can't really see that very well, I don't think. But the um, the points that um, the the uh, criteria for removal of a Significant tree. I think there, uh, the, the ordinance states that one or more have to be met, and I would argue that several of those are met, um, and that I would argue that the the reason for the permit is not that damage has been caused, but I want to, to prevent damage and hazard in the future. Uh, that is actually acknowledged by the the planner that is likely to happen. So um, the areas, the, the, the items that I think are met is that the tree could adversely affect the general health and safety, um, could cause substantial damage, which is referenced several times, is too closely located to existing or proposed structures, again, referenced several times, um, interferes with utility services, which it clearly does, and will be replaced by planting approved by the commission. That was uh, part of my submittal was that I would replace that with a tr more suitable tree in a more suitable location. Um, so I think it meets five of the of the uh, criteria. And in fact, the criteria set or the ordinance states that it has to meet one or more, which it clearly does. So um, again, uh, this is kind of a repeat of, of the denial um, but again, that that there in the denial, uh, I was told that there isn't currently damage. So currently, my house is not burned down because the wire was frayed by the tree, and currently the roots haven't uh, impeded the gas line, but they have the potential to do that. And the whole purpose of the, the removal is to prevent uh, the hazard and prevent uh, damage and. Uh, a risk to my house and my family. You can see how close the wires are to the tree. And again, during last year's storm, I observed the, with the movement from the wind of both the wire and the tree, it does contact the trunk of the tree. So it isn't the branches that we're concerned with, it's the main trunk of the tree. Um, this is a picture of the front of my house. And as you can see, there's a lot of trees on my house. Um, one of the main concerns apparently from the neighbors is the loss of, of trees in the neighborhood. Well, I personally have planted 20 trees on my, my property. And unfortunately I planted the redwood tree. And I, the reason I did is it's given a, to us as a gift. And if I had known then what I know now, I would not have planted it. But I also planted the heritage oak tree you can see on the right that is now being impeded by the, the redwood tree. Two other uh, oak trees I planted that are now heritage oak trees. And like I said, a total of 20 trees I planted on my uh, property. So I agree with 
with the people that express concern about loss of trees in the neighborhood. Uh, I was involved with FOBA more than 30 years ago when we donated time and money to plant hundreds of trees in the neighborhood. And these are some of those that we did. So I am in agreement that the loss of trees is, is not good. But again, uh, you can see that I've done, I think, more than my share of uh, addressing that by planting trees. But uh, also you, from this tree, you can see you can see the oak tree and behind it is the redwood tree and it's clearly impeding uh, the, the heritage oak, which is more valuable and is a native tree as, as the redwood is not. So in summary, I guess I'm, I'm appealing the denial because I believe that my original tree pit permit did meet the, the requirements of the ordinance and was unfairly denied. And um, this is the letter from, no, no, from Candace, my neighbor. And I think she's on the line too, if she wants to uh, point out uh, the points in her email. Ms. Wilhelm, you will have the remaining um, time of the 15 minutes, which is about eight minutes. Great, thank you. Good morning, commissioners, and thank you, Ron. My name is Candace Wilhelm. As Ron mentioned, I'm his neighbor at 539 San Benito Avenue. I live next to the McLeods, and this redwood tree is growing over my property, so I'm directly impacted by it, and I also filed the appeal. Um, so as Ron pointed out, this tree is really uniquely positioned as opposed to other trees in the neighborhood because it is, you know, very close in proximity to both the power and gas lines. Um, and as Ron pointed out, at times touches the power lines. It's growing directly over the McLeod's home, as you saw in their pictures. And it's growing in very close proximity to my home and could cause substantial damage. Um, there are risks to personal injury because the tree is very close to both my front walkways and the area where I park, as well as to Ron's front front walkways in his driveway. And also given the proximity to the utility lines creates fire risk. Um, the county's own letter dated in April, 2023, acknowledged that given the location of the tree and its species, future removal may be warranted. So the county is asking us to wait, wait for further property damage, wait until someone is injured. And we wanna be proactive and take action now, which we think is appropriate to avoid damage both to property and personal injury. Um, you know, as Ron pointed out, they've already incurred expenses and had to take mitigation actions to cut back the tree's roots. Um, and then my own personal experiences with redwood trees, just to give you an example of what I've incurred on my property is my back neighbors have redwood trees that are still young and healthy trees, a bit more mature than Ron's trees, but they've had several large branches, 10 to 15 feet in length at least, fall from the property. One went through my roof, causing over $20,000 in damage. And in our severe storms last February and March, there were probably seven or eight trees that came off a very healthy, still relatively young redwood tree. Um, and had someone been in my backyard, there would have been substantial personal injury or even death. And so those are examples of what will happen with Ron's redwood tree given its proximity to its home and my home. It was in similar proximity to this other redwood tree that I mentioned. Um, and again, with the utility lines, if you have these large redwood tree branches come down, it could easily take out the utility line and create a fire. Um, so those are just you know, some examples of the risks with these redwood trees. And they are you know, very real present risks, even in young, healthy redwood trees. Um, so then moving on to you know, the character of the neighborhood, as you can see from Ron's photos and even the county's photos, there are numerous redwood trees along San Benito Avenue. My back neighbor has four redwood trees on their property um, and the property owner on the other side of my property has nine redwood trees. Um, in addition, there's a property diagonal to Ron's property that has another three or four redwood trees. And again, the county's own photos showed several redwood trees further down. And I think these other redwood trees are positioned differently because they're not you know, immediately next to kind of both houses, the front walkways and the utility lines. Um, so again, given all of the other trees in the neighborhood, there isn't diminished character. And in addition, we want to preserve 
the health of the oak of the oak tree, which you saw from the photos, is an important tree. And that, you know, that tree, frankly, is, you know, kind of larger and more beautiful right now than the redwood tree. And we don't want the redwood tree to cause damage to it. But it, as you saw from the photos, there are numerous trees. So the loss of this one particular tree will not diminish the neighborhood. Um, so I, I think we both really respect and admire the county's desire to preserve trees, you know, but in this instance, this particular tree, given its location to both the power and utility lines and the gas line and being right next to both of our homes, we feel that it should come down to avoid property damage and the risk of personal injury. So we would appreciate your support. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Candice. Any questions? I have. Commissioner Ketchum. I have a question for Mr. McLeod. McLeod? My question is about your proposed replacement tree uh, back by the pool, was it? Uh -huh. uh, it labeled flowering pear. Sure. I'm assuming that is the calorie pear, Vlad, Bradford pear. Do you know another name for it? I just know flowering pear was the name for it. Yeah, the ornamental pear. Or maybe I mean, pear. obviously, yeah, ornamental pear. Right. Pear. So it used to be widely planted and is no longer recommended. It's invasive, uh, has a brittle structure. It produces thorny offspring. Uh, I would not recommend that tree whatsoever. Okay. If, Just this is it's in the side. I know so it's not part of our decision today. Tree on well, no, I didn't want to go that far. I just want to point that out. Uh, that's all I have. I don't have any question. Thank you. So at this time, I'll. Did you have any comment? Uh, well, I just um, wanted to express um, my appreciation to the applicant and appellant. I understand that this is a difficult circumstance. I also know that, um, you know, uh, our planner, Angela, has worked um, very diligently with um, the concerned neighbors to try and strike an appropriate balance here. It's a difficult issue. And so um we're happy to answer any additional questions you may have but um i think the basis for our recommendation is laid out in the staff report and um i haven't heard anything today that um changes the staff's opinion on the matter thank you okay we can deliberate now uh, or, or, well uh is, is there anyone public. who oh, wants to speak right we have Yes. Uh, do we have any public uh, who would like to comment? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And we also did receive one written public comment that was posted to the website and circulated to the commission. And we do have Carolyn Zinko wishing to speak. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Carolyn Zinko. I live across the street from Ron and Candace, directly across from Ron and diagonally from Candace. Um, I did want to second my husband Dan Diegas's, um, uh written support of Ron and uh, Candace's proposal. Um, in principle, I agree with everyone that retaining trees is important and great for the character of a neighborhood. Um, in reality, this is not a lone rare redwood tree. As everyone's pointed out, there are dozens of redwood trees in this neighborhood. There's dozens of, of oak trees and other types of trees. Um, so the removal of one tree, you know, while regrettable is not gonna make, you know, a huge eyesore or impact in the neighborhood. Um, the drought and the rains um, have led to tricky conditions. I think we all have seen and read um, many stories in the local press and seen our neighbors um, have trees fall down onto their houses, have branches fall on their houses and cause damage. Um, you know, as, as Candace mentioned, a different redwood tree, not the tree in question, um, shed some branches that fell onto her roof I was the person that she she knocked on our door, extremely upset, um, 
during the rainstorm and said, Carolyn, Carolyn, where's Dan? Can Dan help me? A tree branch fell through my roof. I can't go in the attic. Can he please come in the attic and help me figure out what's going on? Because I can't tell, you know, I, I heard it. I felt it. There's, you know, water's coming in. Can he help me? So he ran over there with a ladder, went up into the attic, took a look. And as she said, $20,000 of damage from a tree that was younger or, or not um, from a tree that was not showing signs of damage. The trees on the neighbor's property are ostensibly healthy and there was no evidence that they would pose a danger, but they did. So you can imagine how um, frustrated she must feel to hear that she has to wait for more damage from this other tree before you'll let them take it down. So it, I guess what I would say is, it just seems like common sense. Ron's pointed out that the proposal meets many of your recommendations not just one, but more than one. And I just want to wholeheartedly support them because if that tree comes down in a different way, it could impact us across the street. So anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. I just really hope that you'll think about this with, you know, some, some respect for what the people who live on the property are worried about and what they have to go through versus people in the surrounding neighborhood who will not be impacted by any damage that might happen um, and who are just thinking about this for aesthetic reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zinko. Thank you. And with that, Madam Chair, we have no further hands raised for item three. In that case, we close the public hearing. Um, Deliberations by the commissioners. Commissioner Hansen. Everyone in here knows my position with trees. I love them. And I've voted to retain every tree. I can understand this tree coming out. I really can. At the same time, coming out is not cannot cannot be for the reasons that were cited. I don't think this is providing any near term problems. You know, my job is to do, my job is not a political job, but doing what I want. My job is to define have a finding. And I have to be able to stand behind that finding in a court. And while I very much understand taking the tree out, unless some other commissioner could help me with coming to a finding, I'm going to have to uh, go with a denial of your application. Commissioner Ketchum? I agree with Commissioner Hansen. Completely agree. I, I I also agree. You know, um, unfortunately, I, I don't see a good reason for taking this tree down. Um, you know, uh, it, it's it's unfortunate that you know you're the one that planted it and and you you want to take it down. But you know, since you planted it, I mean, the, we have uh, new regulations that do not allow us to take down healthy trees that's my position and and i and i don't think that uh, the uh, proximity to to the uh, utility utility lines uh, is necessarily is not really um in in danger you know at, at all because uh, unfortunately i just had a situation where you know my uh, my own I, I i upgraded the system my electrical drop and Pichini came over and put their line right up against my tree. And I told them, can you please move it farther? And they said, no, it's fine. So it's completely up against the tree. And this one 
it's not touching the tree now, especially since they prune it. There's nothing touching the, those power lines or even the gas line is, is far enough away from the gas line. All right. This, um, um, I add one thing to what I said. I what's going on? Oh, the highlighted um, the appellant. Um, the slide he showed with highlighted the findings that he felt supported his project. Basically, if you just took those findings out and used only that, you could cut down every tree in the neighborhood, seems to me. That's my concern. If those findings, if, if that applies here, it, it could apply to anything, it feels like. Um, I'm more concerned about the fires. Fires that we have seen in the in our county, in in our um, not just the county, uh, because of the power plants. Mm -hmm. That that is one of the things that is bothering me. Other things seem to be fine to me. Uh, I certainly. Uh... Appreciate that concern. And in fact, um, you know, the department has taken action to address that concern by issuing an exemption for hazardous trees that um, really do pose a significant fire hazard. Um, those are certain species that are of particular concern um, and they do not include redwood trees. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that because that was my only concern. Uh, other things I don't think uh, was a concern in my mind. So, but um, seeing power lines close to close to uh, the the main part of the tree was my concern. Thank you. You're welcome. So, do I have a motion? I will forward a motion that the Planning Commission deny the appeal and uphold the decision of the Community Development Director to deny the removal of the 24.3 inch um, DBH Coast Redwood Tree, County File Number PLN 202245. Second. Roll call, please. Thank you. That was a motion by Commissioner Hansen and a second by Commissioner Ketchum. Commissioner Hansen? Aye. Commissioner Ketchum? Aye. Commissioner Serrano Kwan? Aye. Commissioner Ramirez? Aye. Chair Gupta? Aye. Thank you, Chair. Motion carries. And uh, to the property owner, uh, just so you know, this decision is appealable to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, that. Yes, it would be a separate, it would be the same appeal for you. I think we're ready to move on to the next item. Yes, please. So we move on to item four. Uh, Madam Clerk, please read that in and uh, also introduce the presenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is an informational item only, and the, it's a briefing on the project to prepare an environmental justice element of the San Francisco County General Plan, and the project planner is Katie Faulkner. Good morning, members of the commission. My name is Katie Faulkner with the Planning and Building Department, and I'm the project planner for this project. Uh, so today I'll be presenting on a new effort to prepare an environmental justice element of the San Mateo County General Plan. So for some background information, um, state law defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all of people of all races, cultures, incomes, 
and national origins with respect to development, to the development, adoption, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So the reason that we're doing this project is because there is a requirement in the California government code uh, for us to do so. And that requirement was created by Senate Bill 1000 back in 2016. And SB 1000 requires that counties and cities that have disadvantaged communities um, and are also updating two or more elements of their general plan concurrently create either an environmental justice element or integrate environmental justice goals and policies uh, into the other elements of their general plan. So the first requirement of SB 1000 is to identify disadvantaged communities. Um, and SB 1000 provides a few different avenues for doing so, uh, but basically it's looking at low income areas that are disproportionately affected by environmental pollution and other hazards. So staff did some preliminary work before starting this project um, and we determined that we have at least one census tract in North Fair Oaks that uh, could meet the government code definition of a disadvantaged community. Um, and we're also updating to other uh, elements of the general plan at the same time. So we decided that we should move forward uh, with creating an environmental justice element. Um, and we are also going to be doing a fuller analysis uh, to identify all of our disadvantaged communities in the county. So we might add some more um, as that analysis uh, progresses. Um, so after that, SB 1000 requires us to identify goals and policies to reduce the unique or compounded health risks in disadvantaged communities by reducing pollution exposure and improving air quality and also promoting public facilities food access, safe and sanitary homes, and physical activity. Uh, we also need to identify policies to promote civic engagement in the public decision-making process, and we need to prioritize improvements in programs that address the need, the need of disadvantaged communities. So uh, the planning and building department is leading this effort for the county. And we are also working with several other departments um, to make sure we bring in their expertise, uh, including the Office of Sustainability, the Health Department, the Equity Office, um, and we'll bring in any other relevant departments as topics arise. Um, and in addition, this project will be a collaborative effort between the county and two cities in the county, Burlingame and East Palo Alto. Um, and we are collaborating by sharing consultants under one contract, which is held by Burlingame, and then the county has an MOU with Burlingame. Um, so our county environmental justice element will focus on the unincorporated areas specifically, and then each city's element will focus on their jurisdiction. And at the end of the process, we'll have three separate work products. Um, and this collaborative effort is facil facilitated through the group 21 Elements, um, and for anyone who isn't familiar, 21 Elements is a collaborative group that was originally set up to help the county and the 20 cities in the county meet our housing element requirements. Um, and it's facilitated by the consultant Community Planning Collaborative, um, who's also acting as a, a consultant for, for this project as well. Um, so when the county first started scoping this project, we reached out through 21 Elements uh, to the other cities to see who else also had to meet this requirement. Um, and that's how we ended up working with Berlin Game in East Palo Alto. So the primary consultant uh, for doing this work, uh, for creating the EJ element is PlaceWorks. And we also brought on the, uh, the CBO, um, the community-based organization, Climate Resilient Communities as our lead CBO under the PlaceWorks contract. Um, and the benefit of this structure is that a consultant like PlaceWorks has a lot of technical experience working on general plans and creating environmental justice elements and a local CBO like Climate Resilient Communities has more specific knowledge uh, about San Mateo County and the communities and people. And uh, 21 Elements is helping us uh, with the coordination between uh, the, the three cities involved, or two cities in the county involved. Um, and just as a note, this is the same consultant team that will also help us update uh, the safety element of the general plan, which I will speak a little bit more uh, for the next item. So um, this scope of work includes four major tasks. 
The first task is project coordination. So that includes um, joint steering committee with uh, the two cities, as well as jurisdiction specific check-ins. The second task is community engagement, which will be a very important part of creating an environmental justice element and will run alongside the other tasks. The third task is identifying uh, and confirming our disadvantaged communities and our environmental justice focus areas, as well as gathering environmental pollution and hazards data and, engage, and engaging with our partner agencies. And then the final task will be to develop our, our environmental justice element and our policies and programs. So just to go into a little more detail, um, in the scope, we try to include thoughtful approaches to community engagement and equity. And that's why we brought on uh, CBO Climate Resilient Communities to help us lead engagement and outreach to community groups and hard to reach uh, community members and to provide equity focused reviews of our work products. And we plan to engage uh, impacted groups and disadvantaged communities through a robust engagement effort uh, that will include culturally competent workshops, community workshops, and an equity focused survey. Um, and some strategies uh, in our scope of work that we're hoping will help us hear from everyone we need to include having Spanish interpretation at our workshops and having Spanish speaking staff that can engage one on one, uh, providing gift cards to workshop attendees to reimburse them for their time, providing food at events. Um, and in addition to climate resilient communities, we uh, also have in our scope. Um, to uh, engage at least one other local CBO partner for each workshop to help assist with um, outreach and consultation for uh, specific groups or areas. Um, and for the survey, some of the strategies we're including uh, include conducting the survey in up to four languages, uh, going door to door to direct to Canvas um, to reach target demographics, uh, providing gift cards, again, for reimbursement of survey responders time. Um, and we're also planning to create a, a toolkit of educational outreach materials, including things like a website, uh, a story map, and a presentation that staff can give to uh, different community groups as the need arises. Um, and these activities and the feedback we receive will all be summarized in the community engagement report. And the results of all that community engagement will also help guide the creation of our environmental justice policies. Um, so sharing a bit about where we are now, uh, this project started up last summer and it's expected to take about two years to complete. Um, and early work uh, has included, uh, we're working on a community engagement plan right now to uh, specify some of the details of what I just went over. Um, and we're also working on preliminary mapping to help us identify our disadvantaged communities. It's not quite ready to share yet, um, but when it is, we will share with the public and Planning Commission. Uh, and we're also starting, we're starting by pulling available data from the census and other sources, um, but often this data isn't granular enough to capture all disadvantaged communities in the county. So we also wanna make sure that we're incorporating local knowledge as well. Um, and, you know, right now we're at a, we're at a very early stage of this project, um, but we'd like to, you know, uh, request any suggestions for areas that we should look into further um, from the Planning Commission, and we will uh, be doing that as part of community outreach as well. Um, and because we're early on in this project, you know, we don't, our, we're, our website is forthcoming and we don't quite have draft materials to share yet, but um, there will be uh, additional opportunities to comment um, when this uh, material becomes available. Um, so thank you, and I'm available for questions about this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bartman. Questions? No, no questions. No questions. No quick question. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm glad that the department is engaging in this process. Very encouraging. Um, how can we get uh, updates as, as you guys go along? Uh, yeah, well, we can make sure to include the Planning Commission um, on any outreach emails that we include. We'll also be, we can also come back when we have more draft materials to share, to get specific comments. We just wanted to make sure we didn't let too much time go by without 
sharing that this project is is starting up um, and that you might be hearing about it more. So yeah, we can definitely plan to come back and share the draft materials. On your third bullet here, feedback from the commission is it today on location of disadvantaged communities. Yeah, again, it's very early in the process. We're still, um, you know, kind of sifting through the data, but the data doesn't capture everything because we have some small pockets, um, you know, in the larger unincorporated community that might not show up well in census status. We want to make sure we hear from um, people with local knowledge about areas we should be looking at. So yes, if you have anything to share today or later on, you know, please. Do you please have go. Pillar Ridge on your list? Yes, Pillar Ridge is definitely one of the spots where we want to make sure we're looking over there and we're and one of the spots where we know that you know maybe a bigger census tract might not capture the full picture of Pillar Ridge, but yes. Sure wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Um the uh it is kind of different in that the property as a whole, the land itself is owned by a nonprofit, not by the people who own the homes who are mostly low income. Do, does your selection, is it based mainly on income level? So um, the state law does kind of give like a very preliminary framework of looking at income levels, low income levels, and uh, impacts from pollution or other hazards. Um, so that's kind of the basic framework, but there's a lot of different data out there that we're coming through and a lot of different medicines that we can pull from. Um, and so right now we're, we're trying to make sure that we are pulling the right data and focusing on the right areas. Um, and so, you know, the Princeton area, Pillar Point area shows up somewhat in this data, but we also are, we can also have the ability to overlay our local knowledge. Uh, it doesn't just have to be census data that we're pulling from. Yeah, in the case of Pillar Ridge, you have an advantage because the owner of the park, in order to retain the property tax exemption, has to provide show that there's a certain percentage of low income. I don't know whether it's 80, 90 percent is high. And so we every all the homeowners have to fill out an annual income certification form. So they have that um, the owner of the park has that data, uh, which they provide in a, you know, like I say, certain percent. They didn't they don't give you the everybody's income certification, but they can give you the percentages. That's actually and how many in the household all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. That, that's very helpful to know. Um, I'll put that on my list for day, data gathering. As, as far as environmental concerns, we made great progress with the propane yard next door already. Oh, anyway, thank you for this presentation. Commissioner Hansen. Yeah, without anything in front of me, I don't have anything concrete to say other than to give you my interpretation of equity and justice, and I'll do it in a planning sense, is um, go to a sporting event, and I use the restroom, I'm in and out, and I go back, my wife is still standing in line. Now, they may have the same number of stalls and units in it, but that's not equity or justice, even though they got equal numbers. And that's not right. And that's how I'll be looking at it. It is not right. Even though we may say, well, yeah, but X equals Y, and no, it's the, in this case, the amount of time, the amount of access. And so that's how, when it comes back, I'll be looking at it. Thank you. <laughs> that sounds like a change to the building regulations. <laughs> this is the problem, but how do you define it? For the chair, can I say something? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I, I just want to say and commend, you know, the whole team for what they're going to go through. I mean, it's it's a very challenging uh, task uh, on hand, um, and I'm glad to see that you're going to look at the pollution, you know, in different uh, communities that are affected. Uh, my one concern has always been in areas uh, with lack of green areas. You know, I, East Palo Alto and North Fair Oaks, you know, come to mind that are some of the ones that 
really uh, are in need of looking into green areas. Yeah, you're under part. So, yes, I think which is an env environmental, I mean, uh, environmental justice uh, need uh, along those lines. Something to look at, I think, also. All right. Yes. Thanks. So, so to, with all the housing that's being built, the green is disappearing. So, oh, nobody else has. Okay. So, I was looking at some of the other counties. Um, uh, environmental justice element, what they have. In particular, I went, when I do Google search, some of the other counties come up before San Mateo County. Okay. So the, the one that came up on top was Alameda County. And they already had a draft. There, I didn't read the draft because I had my our own uh, information here uh, for our own uh, for our own planning commission, but uh, that brought me uh, thinking that do you or do we share information between? Uh, because there may be different uh, or maybe similar some similarities between uh, the, uh, the situations in different um, uh, different areas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think looking at uh, the work that other counties and cities have done is uh, a good step for this project. Um, I know off the top of my head, our consultant place works. Uh, recently has worked on the environmental justice element for Solano County. So they're bringing that knowledge as well. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll put it on my list to, to take a look at the the EJ element for, for Alameda County because right. it's helpful to learn from our neighbors. So, um, so are, are the, sorry, I, I didn't uh, make a note of uh, whom we have, or whom our county has contracted with, but do they also do work for other counties, similar kind of things for other counties? Yes, they have a lot of experience um, doing environmental justice elements and safety elements coming up. Um, in fact, one of their staff members helped write a guidance on creating environmental justice elements. So um, yes, we're, we're pleased that they have extensive background on this. Okay. So, um, so the work, did it actually just start in summer of this year or was it, uh, there was some other things that were happening even before that, collecting data basically? Yeah, before that was kind of a scoping phase where, you know, we're trying to figure out, are we required to do um, this element? You know, do we think we have disadvantaged communities? Because that was one of the triggers for doing this. Um, and then also, um, yeah, because we're doing the housing element and the safety element, it also triggers us to do this. So yeah, just a lot of a lot of scoping work took place before this, um, and you know, uh, creating kind of our little collaborative with uh, East Palato and Burlingame that all came before the summer. But but the summer is when we got the consultant on board and actually started, you know, officially started the project. Yeah. Like I was surprised to see Berlin game on there. Yeah, they um, they decided that they also you know have this requirement and that they want to create uh, complete an environmental justice element. So um, yeah, we're, we're happy to have them on board. So does the Berlin game also have uh, um, unincorporated areas? Is is that what we are focusing on or? Uh, it's not just unincorporated. 
So for Burlingame and East Palo Alto, they will be focusing on their incorporated areas, um, but we can share knowledge and share this consultant. Um, and we were hoping that there'd be some efficiency in working on this together. Um, and also just having partners to, to go through to go through this effort at the same time we thought would be useful. But technically we're focusing on our, our individual jurisdictions um, while sharing knowledge while we can. I hope. Yeah, I think in the staff report I did read that uh, um, that that even though it's the same agency working for all the city, all those cities, it's providing um, specific information for the county, yeah, right? Because this SP 1000 was passed some years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So different jurisdictions are at kind of different phases of um, right. addressing this requirement. Right. Yeah, it's on the different tasks that you had also mentioned there, the different phases. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm still absorbing that information. There's, there's so much in there. Um, maybe next time when you bring it around, we, I'll have more more to add to this, but thank you. Thank yeah. you for presenting. Yeah, that's part of why we wanted to come early because it's a lot of information. So we, you know, we want to share and then come back and share again when we have more. Thank you very much. I think the same will hold true for our next item. So, which I'm probably. probably ready to proceed to. This was just an information item, so no actions required by the commission. So if uh, yeah. you're ready, Madam Chair, we can proceed to the next item. Uh, oh, thank you. Yes. Good, right. good catch. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. We did not receive any written public comments for item four. There is nobody wishing to speak in chambers and there are no virtual hands raised on Zoom. Thank you. Okay. So in that case, we'll close the public comments. Um, if everybody's okay, we'll continue. If anybody wants to take a break, um, no, we continue. Okay. So then we move on to item uh, five, right? Um, please, um, Madam Clerk, please move on to item five. Thank you. There's an information informational item only, and it is a briefing on the project to update the county's general plan safety elements. And the project planner is Katie Fall. Hey, well, hello again. Um, so uh, I'll start with some background information on safety elements. So California law requires each city and county to, of course, adopt a general plan to guide phys physical development of the community and a safety element is one of the required topics of a general plan. Um, so the safety element identifies natural hazards that may impact a community and policies to help protect um, the community from those hazards. In the current San Mateo County general plan, the safety element is called the natural hazards chapter. And right now that chapter includes policies on geotechnical hazards, fire hazards, and flooding hazards. Um, and uh, the background information on that and that chapter was um, completed uh, a little while ago, so it, it's time for an update. Um, and we're updating the safety element right now because recent changes to state law require us to do so. Uh, so those requirements include updating flooding and fire information policies and mapping. And also a, a big recent requirement is to update climate adaptation and resiliency information policies and strategies and implementation strategies. Um, and that requirement comes from Senate Bill 379 and the, that requirement kicked in when we recently updated the local hazard mitigation plan. Um, and there's also an additional requirement to identify areas that do not have at least two emergency evacuation routes. And we plan to cover all of that in this update. Uh, beyond meeting those requirements, other reasons for updating our safety element include 
updating uh, background information with new science and mapping, uh, updating policies to address that new information and to address new hazards of concern. Um, it'll also help us uh, improve eligibility for grant funding. Um, and uh, this update will also let us incorporate information from the recently updated local hazard mitigation plan. Um, and for reference, the difference between the safety element and the local hazard mitigation plan is that the safety element is a high level uh, broad document that uh, provides a comprehensive safety approach and also um, you know, has, a, has a bit more of a focus on development policies, uh, whereas the local hazard mitigation plan is a more detailed short-term plan on a five-year planning horizon that focuses on specific actions. And safety element um, is a requirement of state law, whereas the local hazard mitigation plan addresses federal uh, regulations. So just a little background on that. Um, so uh, uh, the county, again, is um, leading the effort to update our safety element, but we are working with other departments um, to bring their expertise in as well. So we're working with Office of, Sta Office of Sustainability, uh, Department of Emergency Management, the Health Department, uh, the Equity Office, Public Works, and um, uh, more departments as, uh, as topics arise, um, we, we can bring them into the discussion. Uh, and this project is also another collaborative effort uh, that's facilitated through 21 elements, um, but this time we have a few more cities involved. Um, so we're working with Atherton, Belmont, Brisbane, Burlingame, East Palo Alto, Half Moon Bay, Pacifica, and San Bruno. Um, all those cities had the same requirement to update their safety element. So we reached out for 21 elements and they expressed interest. Um, so again, uh, we're sharing one uh, main consultant to help us uh, update all of our different safety elements. Uh, that consultant is PlaceWorks and 21 elements is helping uh, to facilitate that collaboration. And we also have uh, a lead CBO, uh, Climate Resilient Communities, um, that's also helping us with this effort as well. And again, we will have, while we're all working together and sharing a consultant, we'll each have separate work products created um, at the end of this process, and the county's uh, safety element specifically focuses on unincorporated areas. All right, so uh, here are a few of the big project tasks and um, some estimated timelines that are part of the scope. Um, and so just a note, community engagement and an equity approach will run throughout this project um, and we'll have several different touch points um, that correspond to these other project phases. So um, an early task that we're working on now is to update background information on our natural hazards uh, that affect our county. Uh, another big task uh, that we're starting um, that we're starting up is to create an, a vulnerability assessment and hazard maps, um, and then those early tasks will help us craft new goals, policies, objectives, and implementation measures. Um, and then all of that work will roll up into a complete safety element document. Um, and the scope of work uh, also includes support for environmental review. Um, and also for planning commission and board of supervisors uh, review and approval process. Um, and so now I'll dive uh, into a little more detail about the vulnerability assessment. So uh, the vulnerability assessment is a core part of the technical work that's need needed to update a safety element and it is required by state law. Uh, it will help community members, staff, and decision makers understand how hazards may alter conditions due to climate change and what parts of the community are most at risk. Uh, it identifies people and key community assets that may be affected by climate change. Um, and part of this work will be to gather the most updated data uh, on hazards, assets, and population. And this assessment will get exposure uh, sensitivity and adaptive capacity to help us understand who and what is vulnerable to a hazard. Uh, it will evaluate existing policies and programs to help people um, avoid or recover from impacts. And it will also prioritize vulnerabilities 
that will inform the resilience and adaptation policies and implementation programs that will um, be a part of our updated safety element. So um, as mentioned before, community engagement will occur throughout this project. Um, and the goal of our community engagement effort will be to inform uh, background information that will make up the safety element, uh, also inform the vulnerability assessment and the policies and implementation measures that we identify. Uh, and we are taking an equity focused, <coughs> an equity -focused approach to outreach uh, to ensure that the safety element accurately reflects the hazards and needs of the community. So community engagement will include uh, community workshops, smaller community group meetings in partnership with local CBOs uh, to help us hear from hard to reach communities, stakeholder meetings, a uh, map survey tool, study sessions with the planning commission and the board of supervisors. Um, and then of course it'll all wrap up with public hearings for uh, adoption of the element. Um, and with info from the vulnerability assessment and the input from the public engagement work, uh, we'll then create new goals, policies, and objectives uh, to put into the safety element. Um, we'll also be creating implementation measures that will carry out uh, the, those policy updates. And these tasks will include looking at regional best practices and reviewing our existing plans. Um, and up on the screen are, are some of the kind of examples of outcomes that we could end up with. So we may end up creating new programs. Uh, it'll probably result in new regulations and updates to the zoning code and the local coastal program. We might identify new capital improvement projects uh, that we think would help with, uh, with resiliency, or we might identify a need for more education and outreach on these issues, or we might find that there are areas that, that need more data or more evaluation. So uh, we are currently in the early stages of this project. Um, and right now we're working on compiling data on hazards, populations, and community assets. Uh, we're also working on creating a GIS database for our spatial data. Um, and we're beginning the preparation uh, for the climate vulnerability assessment. And we're also working on preparing a community engagement plan and a website um, that we're hoping to get up fairly soon. Um, and the next steps uh, will include community engagement to share results of initial work, gather feedback, and then update and refine um, those that work based on that feedback. Uh, and then we'll start to draft uh, policies and implementation programs. Um, and we will plan to share more information as it becomes available as we, we get those draft, draft work products. Uh, but we wanted to inform you at an early stage um, and you know, we'd also like to request you know, if there's any early input that uh, the planning mission members would like to share with us, um, we'd, we'd love to hear that. You know, are there any natural hazards or areas of the county that are of particular concern uh, that we should be making sure that we look at or any other general feedback on the project? Um, and I'm also available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Questions, Commissioner Hansen, do you want to start? Well, I'll be looking forward for the, is the next steps area, the drafting policies and information programs, because every time I drive over the coast side to review a project, I'm always reminded that we have really done nothing to reduce the fire load. We all know what the problem is, and it isn't getting better and doesn't seem like we're making any movements to reduce the hazards or the people who are at risk. I, every time I drive through La Honda, particularly, I worry about that. And, you know, implementing what we know is important. Well, actually, the, the hazard tree removal emergency ordinance that you have, at least in my neighborhood, has been put to good use. All our Monterey pines, our sickly Monterey pines, they're gone. Uh, but um, 
do you do you want um any specific input here today or should i write to you uh it might depend on how detailed your input is i thought it's short but i mean just on the issue of at least two emergency exits evacuation routes pillar ridge has one and not only that the entire property is is fenced with a six foot chain link fence and that was required when it was built that was a government requirement so there is there is no fence in the back but that goes up the steep hill it's not only not ada compliant it's you got to be really like a mountain goat but anyway i don't know what you do about that but um that's all pardon good input to have thank you and if you want to share any more um you know for okay. input that's would be appreciated as well yeah um i would say um and i echo their sentiment on those issues uh for me at the top of my head is the flooding uh flooding in north fair oaks flooding in east palo alto uh, but then along is like how do you work with the other communities where you know the water comes up from up uphill and so um i think there is issues where um all those creeks if they can carry that much water and uh maintenance on those creeks i think uh, a lot of trees um that can block uh that are down inside the, the creeks that overgrown uh brush stuff that that can create problems for the creeks getting off of their banks um uh, but you know the flooding that we have down in, in redwood city um on the other side of 101 uh that, that gets co compounded when we have um uh, high ties so how do we handle all of that water um in general just working with all the different areas that are affected as the water comes down from the hills and all the way down to the bay. Yeah. I would just note that's one of the benefits of having this um, collaborative process with the other jurisdictions, because as we know, these hazards don't respect jurisdictional boundaries. Correct. So by collaborating with them, I think we have a greater opportunity to address many of these issues that do cross jurisdictional boundaries. boundaries. Yes, yeah, yeah. We're also working closely with One Shoreline, which is another agency that is going to address some of these cross-jurisdictional flooding issues and sea level rise issues. Right, yeah. But my concern, I think, is that, um, you know, in a huge uh, storm, um, so some, some uh, especially down on the low end, um, some of these communities definitely get more impacted, right? But some of these things have uh, that could be uh, addressed up uphill too, as to how this happens. But some of those jurisdictions may not want to help too much on the situation down below. So anyway, I, I certainly hope through to this uh, work that we can engage other uh, communities, like he says. You know, hazards, hazard, hazard uh, situations don't don't necessarily have, um, you know, a, a one uh, line that cross many uh, jurisdictions. So anyway, it'd be interesting to see how we can make it better to work as a regional rather than one individual place. You know, thanks. That, that's right, because we have been in a drought for so long that that has not been up there on our radar to, <laughs> to look at any kind of flooding type of issues. And now for the last year or so, we, we have been facing the, this uh, flooding issues now, storms and flooding. So. Uh, 
No, th these are some of the hazards or some of the things, safety hazards are some of the things that we can relate to. Yeah, not in the immediate neighborhood, but uh, yes, uh, storms, uh, as you mentioned, so trees blocking uh, the things and like even um, uh, all these branches and things, they just block the things and uh, we all, I think all the regulations and things are fine, but we all need to do our part that uh, it's, a, it's a very good presentation and, and I'm glad that all this work is being done um, to, to have some kind of guidelines in place for people also to pitch in. In South San Francisco, they have a um, thing called uh, adopter drain type of thing. I don't know how many people have adopted the drain. But uh, but it's there. Um, if if I add, I'm glad you brought this uh, the drain situation, because one of the things that I I think that happens every year um, is that the cities, the county, does not go out early enough and clean out the drains to prevent some of this flooding. It's like my street every year is the same thing and i just don't see anybody going around you know doing a deep cleaning because there's tons of garbage that accumulates over the summer on the streets and eventually the water comes and just you know overwhelms uh, the drains and we have major flooding issues yeah thanks thank you for your presentation public comment but um, let's open it for public comment, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Chair. We did not receive any written public comment for item five. There is nobody wishing to speak in chambers and there are no virtual hands raised on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Then in that case, we close the public comments. Thank you, Katie. Great presentation. <laughs> and thank you for all the information you provided. So we move on to correspondence and other methods. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as uh, Angela noted, we received two um, items of correspondence, both which of which were posted on the website. So uh, I have no additional correspondence to report. Uh, moving on to the next item uh, for our next meeting, which will be on December 13th. Uh, we are not proposing to have a study session, but we do have three items on the agenda. There are two coastal development permits for new single family residences on vacant lots on the coast side. One is in El Granada, the other one's in Miramar. And we also have a coastal development permit and grading permit for the Mid Peninsula Open Space District's um, maintenance and restoration program. So, this is a permit that would authorize them to undertake maintenance and restoration activities throughout the properties that they own in the county. Um, moving on to the director's report. Sorry. Yeah. I wanted to inform the commissioners that on uh, December 5th, next Tuesday, the Board of Supervisors will be receiving a report from the Planning and Building Department regarding uh, the Mid-Coast Park and Recreation fees. This is an annual report on mitigation fees that we're required to present to the board. And um, also on December 15th, the California Coastal Commission will be conducting a hearing on our local coastal program amendment for the uh, Pescadero area, which would allow us to proceed with the permitting of the new fire station and the waterline extension to the school. Uh, the Coastal Commission meeting will be in Santa Cruz, so not too far away. It's uh, Friday. It looks like our item will be coming up fairly early in the morning. Um, it's the meeting will also be um, broadcast on Zoom, um, 
And I would encourage the commissioners to either come attend in person or uh, check it out online. Um, you know, uh, we often talk about coastal issues and our coastal permitting procedures. And it's, um, I think, quite interesting to watch the Coastal Commission at work uh, addressing some of the same issues. And um, there are some tricky issues raised by this local coastal program amendment that we propose that I think will uh, receive a lot of attention and discussion. So it should be an interesting meeting. And um, could you send us a link? Maybe? Yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. And uh, that's all I had for my report today. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions from commissioners? Yes. Commissioner uh, Ketchum. Do you have any updates on the housing element? Yes. Um, so we've been working with a consultant to update our sites inventory um, and also to respond to some of the issues that the state raised regarding the sites we identified as being eligible that they questioned whether or not they would be able to develop at the levels that we identified. Um, and so through our work in um, providing those justifications and also taking a closer look at our sites inventory, we're um, very close to having a better sense of what additional rezonings will need to take place. I think that's um, one of the crux of the, the challenges that we're dealing with is um, to the degree that we cannot identify adequate sites under our current zoning, we must identify rezoning programs. Um, we have uh, proposed a rezoning program for unincorporated coma. Um, to help address the additional units needed. Um, and we continue to have discussions with the city of Belmont regarding the possibility of adding additional housing uh, development potential within the unincorporated Harbor industrial area. So uh, once we kind of refine our sites inventory and figure out what the Delta is to meet our regional allocation, we will um, um, hopefully conclude our discussions with the city of Belmont and hopefully have a plan that will satisfy our regional allocation. I anticipate that um, that will uh, be presented to the board in late January, early February. The August 1st board Staff report mentioned assessing higher density for co-site R3 uh, the, and C1 sites. Has that gone anywhere? Um, Barat is here. Good morning, Barat. So um, I think he's better prepared to answer that question than I am. I've got to run for a doctor. Good morning. Uh, Let's see. Commissioners. Uh, so in the process of that site analysis, we're also looking at uh, the co site. Uh, so that work is ongoing. And hopefully, uh, once the consultants have provided us uh, a draft, uh, we'll know more specifically in terms of what would be the need or uh, the, the intensity of development uh, on the co site. At, at this point, uh, it's a bit up in the air because we're trying to estimate uh, the capacity on the base site, and if the base site capacity with the rezoning, as we've mentioning of, of Colma and some of the other uh, locations, do, does work out, the intensity on on the coast site uh, will not be needed, or uh, maybe much lesser than anticipated. But at this point, we don't have that information yet because they are working on the actual numbers at this point. Thank you. Commissioner Ketchum, if you do have feedback about how we might approach that analysis or if you have particular concerns or ideas, um, we're certainly open to them and you should feel free to send them to us offline. Thank you. Um, and and it, through the, uh, to the commissioner, if I just may add, um, there have been new laws that have come in which uh, uh, put the co-site uh, under um, 
the SB35. Right. So we are also looking at that as a potential to sort of identify new sites. But as I said, we're focusing on the base site primarily and the sites that we already uh, we are analyzing. And once we've done the analysis, we'll, we'll see what that means. So we are actually considering um, the impact of uh, 423, uh, which- That opens. would be more like just putting sites on the map or something, yes. rather than a rezoning? Yes. Uh, it, 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 the way that uh, SB 423 works is if uh, an area is already identified for um, multifamily, then those uh, become streamlined and they don't have to go through a, a, the, the permit, permit process is ministerial. So that opens up the capacity uh, of having new housing in the area in the next eight years. Is there any news on the fate of the tree ordinance? Um, yes, it's... Um very close to being uh, released for public review. What we're working on right now is um, a lot of good feedback came out from this uh, steering committee work that was done previously. Um, and what we're trying to do is craft the update such that we have clear and simple and streamlined reg set of regulations as possible, accompanied by a guidance we started out as a guidance document and that has evolved into more of an interactive website where people who are interested in removing a tree can get all the information that they need regarding you know the permitting requirements and so forth there's also it's also going to contain a lot of helpful information about tree maintenance tree protection and so forth so um that's the last piece of the work that's occurring now that it needs to be completed before we release it for public review, which I expect will occur early next year. Good. And lastly, Plan Princeton. Yes. Um, Barad is uh, <laughs> luckily still here. Um, and Katie as well has been working um, on that. So Barad, please take it away. So we are, uh, we are, Working on that uh, effort, uh, I, I believe we've uh, done some analysis on the sea level rise, which you know uh, impacts how land use should be done. So what we are working on is in a community engagement uh, strategy right now to re-engage the community, because it's been somewhat uh, some time since the uh, the plan was uh, you know in, uh, the community was engaged on the plan. So. Uh, Tentatively, probably uh, sometime in February, we would we are looking to do a community outreach. But before that, we have to get uh, some work done on our end, and then also reintroduce the project back to the community. So we're working on that plan. Uh, we can certainly uh, we we will certainly update the uh, the commission um, once that is in place and what the schedule is. So I'm looking forward to provide uh, providing uh, our work plan earlier than uh, this year, uh, next year. So hopefully in, in January um, or early Feb, we'll, we'll present the work plan for long range planning to you and we will speak at length about planning this too. Okay, thank you. That's all for me. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Madam Clerk. <laughs> Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.